had the pleasure of interviewing Georgie Dinkoff the other day for our Age Reversing Blueprint podcast, and I felt that I needed to do a summary video because the content that Georgie shares is so immense and so detailed that sometimes it can go over our heads and we miss the point. And I listened to this podcast three or four times, and I'm creating this review, and the five steps that I want you to be aware of to be able to increase your metabolic flexibility. So the first thing that I did was summarize Georgie's response to what does it mean to be metabolically flexible? The best example is a young, healthy child. Um, basically, they will oxidize whichever one of the two major macronutrients you give them at the time, either fats or, or glucose. And of course, we can also oxidize protein, but it gets converted to glucose. So ultimately, we're oxidizing either fats or glucose. So I think everybody who's, who's been around children or has children has noticed that uh, children are, you know, uh, process food very quickly. They get hungry very quickly. They can also get tired very quickly, but they also recover much faster. Um, and let's say if you don't provide them a glucose for, for a period of time, they'll get a little crazy here because they're kind of switching over to the oxidation of fat but but you know the energy is still there and then when you feed them they they usually try they usually get sleepy and then they fall asleep they recover and they wake up they're they're ready to go again uh that's kind of the process that we're seeing start to degrade as age advances um and 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 with, uh, towards i think late 30s maybe or even mid 30s we're starting to see various degrees of insulin resistance in the in the general population if they're not even if they're not for, uh, formally diabetic or have a health problem yet in other words there seems to be both an accumulation of extra fat especially around the middle section um and also a tendency towards inability to properly oxidize the glucose um and a lot of a lot of people interpret that as oh i just need to cut down on my glucose intake but a child can actually handle this glucose intake without any problem. So something is happening metabolically or, or you know, maybe even genetically, as you said earlier, that is, that is shifting us towards insulin resistance as we age. And there's there's been a you know a, a great debate going on for at least for at least a hundred years. What exactly is causing that? And there was a gentleman called uh, I think John Randall uh, who who published a, a study on the so-called infamous Randall cycle. And he said uh, at at the very base there's a at the very fund at, at the fundamental level biological there's a competition between fatty acids, free fatty acids, and glucose for oxidation because they're competing for cofactors. Uh, they're competing for the cellular machinery that is in the cell that basically converts all fuel that we're eating into carbon dioxide and water. Ultimately, those are the final products. And of course, ATP. So if you're all, if the cell is getting a supply, because the, the only thing the cell can do is whatever is being supplied to it in terms of fuel. So if you supply glucose, the cell will oxidize primarily glucose. If you supply fat, the, the cell will uh, oxidize primarily fat. If you supply both, then, it, then it, it depends really on two things. What's the relative amounts of each? Um, and I guess that threshold, that ratio, ideal ratio is different for, not ideal, but the ratio at which you become metabolic and flexible is different for everybody. But if you supply, let's say, a ratio of three to one fatty acids to glucose, the cell will mostly oxidize the fat. And if the glucose amounts are beyond what the cell can currently oxidize, given that it's oxidizing mostly fatty acids, then something needs to happen to the glucose. All right, so it can get very complicated after that. So what I've done is I've created a outline on the whiteboard here to discuss exactly what Georgie discusses so that you can understand more clearly just exactly what he's talking about. And I want you to walk away with five instructions or five steps for you to be able to become metabolically flexible because that's what we're seeing. 88% of Americans and the world for that matter are becoming metabolically inflexible. And I think that because we're vilifying carbs and we're embracing a mildly ketogenic diet or a high ketogenic diet or high fats and really not eating the carbs that we need to produce energy, it puts more fuel on the fire. And I know I'm guilty of this myself personally and my coaching clients that I work with. So I wanted to create this video for you. So let's summarize up until now. So basically I asked Georgie, what does it mean to be metabolically flexible? And his answer is you look at a young child, a young child, if they're um, healthy and they get a, a glucose for their meal, they will generate energy very quickly. They'll get hyper. They tend to be very tired after they may fall asleep and then they recover very quickly. And when they're not getting fuel, they become very, very cranky and their body shifts into lipolysis. That means burning fat. 
and then when you give them a fuel again, they're able to effectively burn glucose. And what Georgie is saying is as we get older, there's environmental factors, there's wear and tear, there's stress, there's cortisol. There's a lot of different things that impact our ability to become metabolically flexible where when we're not getting glucose and we're burning fat, to be able to shift that system off and then be able to turn on the system for burning glucose again. And I wanna to explain to you exactly why that is and what's happening. So ultimately what happens is when that kid gets, hasn't been eaten, eating for a while and then they get a, a glucose meal or a sugary meal, what ultimately happens is that causes insulin to rise. And because insulin is anti-lipolytic, which basically means it's not gonna allow you to burn, gluco uh, burn fat, it allows you to burn glucose. And because insulin is sensitive and it's not resistant, your body will lower the demand for lipolysis because you've been eating this way or you've been fasting and it will burn the glucose. However, over time, especially with seed oils, uh, soybean oil, corn, bean, corn oil, even high fructose corn syrup and cortisol, what ends up happening is when that person stops eating the higher fat meal and shifts into glucose, the glucose can't get processed effectively because they're not responding to insulin. And ultimately, he talks about the Randall cycle. So the Randall cycle is the cycle that states that when you have glucose coming into the cell, your body will burn glucose. When you have fat coming into the cell, it will burn fat. But depending on the ratios will depend on what fuel primarily gets burnt. And if your body is burning fat and you have too much glucose coming in at the same time, ultimately what happens is the glucose can't go to completion. It can't create energy um, by going through Krebs cycle. And ultimately what happens is the Krebs cycle says, hey, pump the brakes, we're processing fat here. And whatever glucose is in the system will turn oxidized. And that means that you'll have these extra hydrogens that were supposed to get into Krebs cycle and create energy uh, and create ATP, H2O, CO2. But ultimately what happens is it isn't, it isn't able to do that. So you have all these electrons that are not going anywhere and there's two places it can go. It can go into glycolysis and that will build up pyruvate. And when pyruvate builds up, you will also convert that into lactate. And what also happens is if you're not able to get your glucose into Krebs cycle, you'll, you'll end up making more uh, fat as a result. And that's what is called metabolic inflexibility. And some of the things that make that worse that I find with my coaching clients is the fact that you may not be getting enough calories on a daily basis, and that can be very stressful. And what happens, which I thought Georgie talked about, which is quite amazing, is that studies are showing that the the amount of glucose that's being processed in the blood studies are showing they're from non-dietary of origin and what that means is when we're stressed when we have financial stress relationship stress emotional stress chemical stress environmental stress inflammatory stress that causes our cortisol to rise and that cortisol dumps glucose into the bloodstream and when you're keeping your carbs low in your diet and you're not getting the amount that you need to convert into energy, paradoxically is gonna raise your cortisol and dump glucose into the bloodstream anyways. And then on top of that, if you're overweight and you're releasing uh, adipose stored fat into the cell to be burnt or you're eating higher percentages of fat, then that's where you have a broken down Randall cycle. And as a result, that glucose can't go to full completion for energy. You have these too many electrons that are causing pyruvate to, um, to convert into lactate. And it's becoming an oxidant, which means it's accepting the electron. And that's what Georgie says is we look at there's all these free radicals and oxidants that are too high. But really, the oxidants are accepting the electrons, the reducers, because of the fact that we have a broken down Randall cycle. So anyways, as far as what I wanted to share with you is the five things that Georgie recommends that will help to put the brakes on this. Number one is obviously limiting your supply of fats. I mean, of course, we wanna completely eliminate, if possible, the seed oils of canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, but PUFAs in general. And fish oils are PUFAs. And these PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, they have double bonds. And when they are released because you're having to burn fat in lipolysis,
then they can oxidize and that can create these chemical mediators that are inflammatory, raising your cortisol, causing glucose to be dumped into the bloodstream. And now you have this competing nutrient of glucose and fat and you have a broken down Randall cycle. So limiting your supply of fat. And I also like the idea of figuring out 30% or less of your total dietary requirement. And I'll do another video figuring that out for you and how we figure that out. The second thing is reducing stress. Anything that reduces cortisol is not gonna pump glucose into the bloodstream. Easier said than done. I have a series of videos on that. The next thing is ergogenic aids. So things like willow bark. Now again, talk to your doctor. This is for information purposes only, but willow bark, 100 milligrams to 120 milligrams. Caffeine, 50 to 100 milligrams. Niacinamide, 50 to 100 milligrams even vitamin E. These can be great ergogenic aids that put the brakes on the too much of fatty acids that are going into Krebs cycle that say, hey, glucose, we can't process you. And when you reduce those demands, then you can process the glucose more effectively. And then the fifth thing that we like to see is actually getting more carbs, believe it or not, that can be easily converted into energy. So this means avoiding the res resistant starches, the green bananas, and the things that aren't cooked as well because we used to think that it doesn't spike our glucose and it doesn't cause in a, um, a, 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 a too, elevate, too much elevation of our insulin. But ultimately what happens is that feeds the endotoxins, creating more inflammation, raising your cortisol, again, paradoxically, because you're not getting the right carbs. So we're thinking about fruits, we're thinking about um, honeys, we're thinking about white rice, potatoes, as long as they're really cooked and they're being um, converted into energy more efficiently, so long as you aren't low on your caloric um, deficit, meaning you're not expending so much more energy than you're eating, because then that's gonna increase the demand for lipolysis. So we wanna go about it in a very conservative way. And we also wanna make sure that we're aware of the fact that we know how much carbs, proteins, and fats that we are getting, because when I talk to my coaching clients, they have no clue. So in this video, I just wanted to summarize the video that we did with Georgie. I wanted to talk to you about what it means to be metabolically flexible and inflexible, and I wanted to give you some solutions to be able to address that. In my next video, we're gonna be figuring out how to determine what your macronutrients should look like. If you got any value, just make sure you just smash the like button and give me a comment if you have any questions that you want me to answer, and I'll see you on the next video.